The original Green Arrow, Oliver Queen, reemerges after years of being assumed dead. How has Oliver Queen returned and refilled his quiver? Find out on this Geek History Lesson Book Club episode on Kevin Smith's Green Arrow Quiver. Welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Green Pixie Boots Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or trick arrow from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour, except this week because it's book club time, kids. Yeah, Ashley, what is the book club exactly? In case somebody is like, they're a big Green Arrow fan, this is their first Geek History Lesson ever. What is what is book club? What do we do here? So book club is something that we've been doing for, oh, about eight months now. Yeah, all where, of 2019. Yeah. <laughs> where once a month we let you know that we are reading an important comic book type book and you read it along with us. We discuss it. If you donate to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Jawin, even for one dollar, then you can comment and we will read your comments, concerns, and uh, uh, trick arrow suggestions here on the podcast. You get to be part of the discussion. yeah, Because uh, they're our tastemakers and we love them. Yeah, and we've been kind of just sort of molding our way through uh, general comic books. We haven't really had a theme and we have always been big fans of Green Arrow. Yes. And this has for a long time, this, I will say this just now, I guess this is the podcast. I was waiting to say this for the podcast, but here's the podcast. (laughs) Green Arrow Quiver is the book that made me love Green Arrow. And if people don't know, uh, Jason has always been a big advocate for Green Arrow. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we did a Green Arrow lesson episode 36, our second year. And I will just say I own every, almost every six inch version of Green Arrow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is this is the start of the run that made me love Oliver Queen, and that's why we picked the book to do. Yes, uh, so this is always a, a very a big favorite of ours. All right, so let's jump very quickly into the ten cent origin on Green Arrow Quiver, the book of this week's book club. Ashley, uh, what is the ten cent origin? The ten cent origin is the first part of the podcast where Professor Jason is going to give you all the who's its and what's its galore about Green Arrow Quiver in case you go to a cool comic book themed cocktail party and someone asks you what's up with this book. So Green Arrow Quiver collects Green Arrow, the 2001 series, issue number one, to issue number 10. It was written by movie director Kevin Smith. It was penciled by the amazing Phil Hester. It was inked by Andy Parks, colored by Guy Major, lettered by Sean Connott, and the original covers for the series were by Luminary artist and creator, creator of uh, Mage, the hero d- Mage. denied and defined and, and, reborn. De- and discovered, uh, discovered. Uh, Matt Wagner. Mm-hmm. The synopsis for this series is the original Green Arrow, Oliver Queen, reemerges after years of being assumed dead. But many people, including Black Canary, his ex-lover, Arsenal, his ex-partner, Connor Hawk, his ex-son, no, his still son, <laughs> and temporary successor, and Batman the Dark Knight Detective, want to know how Green Arrow survived the airplane explosion and where he has been. So again, I'm very excited to talk about this. and. Oh wait, Ashley. There's somebody at the GHL door. Oh, can you can you get? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll go. I'll go. Let them in. I'll let okay, them in. Real okay, quick. okay, okay. My name is Oliver Queen. Oh, hi, Oliver Queen. I'm a big fan. Yes, I'm here, Ashley, because mm-hmm. support for my interruption and your podcast comes from Manscaped, who is number one in men's below the belt grooming. Ooh, tell me more. Manscaped, Ashley. Offers precision engineering tools for your family jewels. That rhymed. Are the queen family jewels taken care of by Manscaped? Well, actually, I want to tell you, you know, I got this nice looking Van Dyke beard on my face. Very true. Yes. I look like Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn got it from me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I also have a nice little Van Dyke south of the border, if you know what I mean. Just above Tweedledee and Tweedledum. <laughs> oh, I, I would have thought maybe it was an arrow, but a Van Dyke is very creative. No, no. It's the, uh, it's the Van Dyke because... That's how I get all the pretty birds, you know, the the ladies, the chicks. Because with the help of Manscaped, I make sure that the magic beans always look good for the birds of prey. <laughs> I bet they really appreciate that. I know Dinah must be a fan. Yes. Uh, now, if you don't know this, Ashley, Manscaped, my favorite company. Yeah. I besides, don't, I the don't... Peop- besides the people that make my arrows, by the way. Uh, uh, I don't yes. know a lot about them, so please go yes. on. Uh, 
They have the Lawn Mower 2.0. Okay. Now, this is a shaver that has skin-safe technology so that the trimmer won't nick the skin of your wedding tackle to create a zero hour, if you know what I mean. Uh, and as, as someone who... Uh, specializes in piercing skin, you would know all about this. Yeah. I mean, because you don't want to use the same trimmer on your face that you're using on your pork dumplings, if you pardon my French. Holy smokes, you are absolutely correct. <laughs> now, they also have some cool stuff like the plow, uh-huh. which has perfect precision shaving. Great. Um, now, I also have an arrow that does that. Precision shaving? Yeah, out of my out of my quiver. It actually shaves off the perfect part of the whirly gigs, if you know what I say. Love it. Yeah. Now, <laughs> Netscape... You might be just saying to yourself, hey, this is all razors and trimmers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh -uh, Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No. Oh, there's more? They have more in the quiver. Like, I have a boxing glove and a freeze arrow and all that stuff. Tell me more. Well, they have a crop preserver. It's an anti-chafing giblet deodorant and moisturizer. (laughs) Great. That's very important. Humidity is a thing. You're in a tight costume. And a cool little kit like the crop cleanser. Because you got to keep the kangaroo apples clean in the watchtower. Kangaroo apples, huh? If you know what I'm saying. I think I do. They're a great company. Seriously. They, I'm not, they, this, this, is, this company has the Oliver Queen seal of approval. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there's another company out there like this for men. I don't think so. They sound amazing. So you can get 20% off with free shipping and a free travel bag with the code GEEKHISTORY. That's G-E-E-K-H-I-S-T-O-R-Y at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping and a free travel bag at manscaped.com. Use the code GEEKHISTORY. Tell them that Oliver Queen and Geek History sent you. And you know that Oliver Queen doesn't back any fat cats, so this is legit. That's right. I just want to let you know, I have permanently added them to my quiver, and my landing gear has never looked better. Amazing. I can't wait to see. Arrow away! <laughs> oh, bye. He just swung out the window. I hope we're insured for that. Hey, uh, I just saw Oliver Queen come by. Yeah, he, he like smashed out the window. Yeah. It was dramatic. Uh, by the way, Mans- oh. Manscaped? Mm-hmm. Cool company. Yeah. He, Seriously. He, he dropped Seriously. off a bunch of shavers for you. I know. I, the, the kit is pretty damn cool that he dropped off for yeah, us. Um, yeah. I'm going to use the hell of it. Okay. All right. So uh, time to talk about Quiver. Let's do it. Yes. And no more King Grab apples. But you know what? Uh, I will say this: that type of joke is very on brand for this book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're correct. It couldn't have come at a more timely episode. Um, okay. So we need to set the stage for Quiver. Yes. Um, now, I think that Quiver is a very accessible Green Arrow book. The reason mm-hmm. why I say this is because it was the first Green Arrow book that I ever read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I will also say that when I read this book, I also was very cognizant of the DC universe. Mm-hmm. And this book posits you in a DC universe where Oliver Queen has been dead for at least five years, yeah, six think, years. Yeah. So a significant chunk of time. It's been a while. During that time, Connor Hawk, his son, his illegitimate son, uh, took over the role of Green Arrow, and the world basically moved on. And Connor Hawk was Green Arrow, I think, for about five or six years. And Connor's amazing. We are big fans here on the podcast. I like Connor Hawk. So that's where the story starts. Mm -hmm. And Oliver Queen starts brand new, and nobody really knows what he's like. The book doesn't uh, actually start with Oliver Queen, ironically. Well, enough. it starts with Superman, <laughs> Batman, and a tie back to Final yeah, Night. Yeah, yeah, but we yeah. don't need to talk. This is a, this is ten issues, so we don't need to talk about every single thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first thing I want to talk about is what I think is the best feature of this book, and it's the very first thing you see in this book: the amazing art. Uh huh. I think Phil Hester knocks this book out of the park. Just so far out of the park. Um, you know, I don't think we did our meet cutes on this. We didn't. Um, but I'm just going to say, um, I'm going to tell you a story here that um, Phil Huster's art is Green Arrow to me. Mm-hmm. And the, I'm so happy he actually stays on Green Arrow for quite a while. Yeah, through the Judd Winnick run. Yeah. For a good chunk. I, I think he leaves around issue th- somewhere in the 30s or 40s. But he draws the Brad Melter. He draws the next Archer's Kevin Quest. Smith series. He draws the Brad Melter series, and then I know this because I read all of them, and now I am reading the Judd Winnick. Yeah, he doesn't. Take, he doesn't. He misses a couple issues here and there. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, he do, yeah, But yeah. he draws a good chunk. I think. I think draws almost forty issues. The next around mm-hmm. most of the next forty issues he draws, which is incredible. Um, which is amazing. Um, 
And there's a story I have specifically related to this book. Okay. Um, one of the very last weekends I, when I used to live in Kansas, uh, there was a comic book convention, Planet Comic Con, which we have been guests of before, which is an amazing convention. They, in Can- they can invite us back at any time. We loved it. They can. We had a great time at Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I went to the, I think, second ever Planet Comic Con they'd ever had. Wow. And I went with a very good friend of mine, uh, Jeremy Skinner and Joshua Tickner, who are very good friends of mine. And we went there because that same weekend, Kevin Smith was doing a Q&A in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. So I was like, let's do both. Sounds really cool. And I specifically took my copy of Quiver because Phil Hester and Andy Park were at the convention. Mm-hmm. I got them to sign my copy of Quiver. And then at the show that night, I got Kevin to sign my copy of Quiver as well. So I have, still have that trade paperback mm-hmm. signed by all three of the artists. That's amazing. Um, and I, yeah, especially the, I, I love to get the inker as well. I have some Jim Lee stuff where I've gotten Scott Williams to sign it as well. And mm-hmm. that means more to me because they like, it's a, it's a partnership. Um, Absolutely. So I can't talk about this book without talking about how amazing Phil Esther is. Um, I think, Ashley, this is, is this, this is not the first, is this the first Green Arrow run you've ever tried to read? No. Okay. What is the first? Oh, the Jeff Lemire? I read the New 52 Green Arrow. Okay. So like, yeah. So did you start with the Jeff Lemire or did you start with the stuff before Jeff Lemire? I started with volume one. <laughs> okay. So yeah. You're not so good. So, um, um, yeah. It really picks up when Jeff Lemire comes on. That's also around the time that Arrow was in development and airing. Sure. Um, so both of them are borrowing from each other very heavily. But I want to know from you... Yes. Uh, have you, what did you think about Phil Hester's art? Because I think he does a lot of the heavy lifting, and I think a lot of his energy and a lot of his figures are what makes this story so great. Uh, I don't mean this to sound disrespectful, but Kevin Smith is so lucky to have Phil Hester on yeah. this book. Uh, I live for the way Phil Hester draws women mm-hmm. because he draws them strong and he draws them like Black Canary has thick thighs because mm-hmm. she's strong and she's muscular. And that's a very difficult thing that comic book artists struggle with where um, the women either look like skinny, skinny little models, which is fine. Some women look like that. Sure. Um, but I like it when they can make a woman look muscular and strong without looking masculine. And that's a difficult thing, especially for male artists who obviously don't have female anatomy themselves. I think he really excels at that. I also think that the letterer, can you tell me the letterer's name again? Uh, I, I, I'm past that page. I'm I sorry. apologize. Um, I think the letterer does a huge chunk of the heavy lifting. So many dialogues. Uh, throughout Quiver because uh, this is, you know, Kevin Smith's first uh, big comic book project. And over the course of the book, you're sort of watching him learn how to write a comic, and you watch. The I think this is his second, actually. You, I um, think he he wrote Guardian Devil before this. Okay, my I thought this was his first. No, this big is his second work. Okay, no. it's the second work. Uh, um, the letter is Sean Connaught. Thank you, thank you for going back um, yeah. and, and finding that for me, uh, Sean. You crushed it. You were able to put a lot of words on the panel and preserve the integrity of the art, which is a hard thing to do. And letter lettering goes. Unsung. I have two things I mm-hmm. want to add real quick. Uh, one, I would love to, if, if you're fine, and if it comes up, let's couch the Kevin Smith of it all. That's, that's I, fine. I, I, until the end. Because, yeah. it, it, again, it, I wanted to start with the artist and end with the writer. Sorry. Uh, no, no, it's, it's fine. It's totally <laughs> cool. There's no, actually, there's no wrong discussions here. Yeah. You did nothing wrong. But um, <laughs> I just know it's going to be a big discussion. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So I'm kind of like, let's talk through. Let, let, Great, let's. Because that could honestly be a whole episode is Kevin Smith writing comic books, to be honest with you. It really could. And, sure. if, and if you want to request that, please do. Um, I wanted to go back to your previous point of Phil Hester. Yes. Um, F- Kevin Smith requested yes. Phil Hester. Yes. So in the intro, which now we're going back to Kevin Smith, so sorry, which opens oh, no, no, by no. taking a shot at Rob Liefeld, which does make me laugh, um, specifically tells the story of bringing Phil Hester onto the book. Because uh, Phil Hester uh, did a great run of Swamp Thing, yes. if you've ever read it. Um, I just think Phil Hester is so underrated. He is. Um, he's also, I will say, a very nice man online. Okay. Now, I want to talk about the first issue is basically you meet all the other characters in wherever they are in their scenes. Like Black Canary gets a scene yep. and uh, Connor gets a scene and stuff like that. Good choice, bad choice. What do you think? I kind of like it. What do you feel about it? I like it because they are characters that were active in the world at the time. So this is a great way to... Get a lot of exposition out of the way and set the groundwork for the incredible act of bringing a character back to life. I think it's a very smart choice to catch everybody up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we have to talk about this a little bit. In the first issue, there are some, I would say, dated 
things. I would say in poor taste. Uh, you, you want to talk about this a little bit? Uh, absolutely, because I made notes of all of them. Oh, please do. Um, oh, and if, um, if, if, feel free to jump in at any point with your notes. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Well, most of them um, actually have to do with Black Canary. Okay. Um, and this also kind of goes back to the Kevin Smith of it all. And specifically the, in the first issue? Specifically in the first issue okay. and the types of content that we're used to seeing from him. Um, Adult characters can do adult things, but there is a certain expectation in mainstream comic books of what those adult things are. Um, I'm mixed on the fact that we start with, if you have children, cover their ears, maybe. We start with, there's an oral sex scene. Oh, yes. In the first issue. In the opening pages. And I was like, I don't know if I need this. Um, Black Canary is having a lot of emotions and it's reduced to a PMS joke, which I think is incredibly disrespectful. It's not funny. And the fact that Dinah makes that joke about herself, it's not like some... Uh, a bad guy is making this joke at her or some man makes it and she gets to slap him down. She says that about herself and that's pretty degrading. And then she gets kissed uh, with without consent. So like it's kind of three big mm-hmm. blows to this incredibly powerful character and this important part of Green Arrow's mythology. Um, and that makes me sad. She later goes on um, to do some really incredible things, but... You're right. It's a mark of the time and of the types of things that were considered funny or were, weren't were considered over the line that by modern standards are. There's also a character who pretends to be homosexual in here. Yes. And he uses the F word Stanley at Dover. the end. Yes. And for me, like I fully clutched my pearls well, at that. And again, mm-hmm. the word has always been offensive, but this book was written. 2001. Yeah. Like almost 20 years ago mm-hmm. now. So. It's not that it's not worth discussing, but it's also worth noting that this book was written at a different time in a different place in our society. Well, I'm going to say one of two things. Mm-hmm. Again, um, Kevin Smith is a director and a writer known for, I, I don't want to say teenager movies, but I don't know how to say. I know what you mean. His movies are poop jokes mm-hmm. and penis jokes. Yeah. That's what that's what his movies are. Yeah. They really are. Yeah. Um, and you have to en- you have to enjoy that and, to enjoy his work. And there's a little bit of that in here. Mm-hmm. I also will say this about Quiver. I think Quiver reads much better collected. I can't imagine I reading it issue to issue because I'll say this. I think it takes four issues to get good. I th- I will definitely and agree And from with the that. fourth issue on, you're just like, ugh, this is great. Yes. Yeah. Um, when it starts actually getting into some of the bigger, more complicated ideas. It's For me, it's s- specifically the Watchtower scene. Uh As soon as Uh Oliver meets the Justice League, you're just like, oh, here it is. This is the story that I wanted to read. Yeah. Um, And I don't mean to, um, I know it probably sounds like I'm just dumping on this book right away, but I'm glad that we talked about that right up front Um, because I did actually really enjoy this book. (laughs) uh, I I did too. Um, But I, I think it's when Kevin Smith, the great thing that Kevin Smith does in this book is that this book, I think, humanizes a good chunk of the DC universe. It makes them Mm -hmm. real people. Um, This is the book that taught me and Archer's Quest by Brad Meltzer that Oliver Queen is a terrible person trying to do well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a smart read of Oliver Queen. Um, I think that's something that um, the television show gets right, even though there's a, he's a different Oliver Queen. Yeah. But he's he's an Oliver Queen where he's sometimes too mean and too serious to people. Mm-hmm. And then he realizes, oh, man, this is an Oliver Queen that... Um, he's a little more impulse driven. He's a little more... I want to say base, but that's not He's right. driven by his heart. Yeah. Well, and also by something a little south of the border. Well, by heart, you know. You know <laughs> uh, um, his, his Van Dyke, you mean? Yes, yeah. Uh, his kangaroo apples? His second Van Dyke. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, so he... It's the idea that yeah, he'll be impulsive and maybe sleep with somebody when he yeah, shouldn't be. Yeah. But but he'll punish himself. Um, but and he also gets to go to heaven, which is interesting. I think it's because which, in... Sorry, go ahead. Now, here's the other thing. And we can talk about this. Kevin Smith, at this time, religious. Yes, n- and he no was, longer, yeah. He was still religious, and yeah. he's no longer religious. Um, again, Kevin Smith wrote Dogma. Um, I think you that that bleeds into this book as well. Uh-huh, um, but it does. 
I was going to say, I think that's more of the fact that Oliver Queen is overall a good person. It's that it's not it's not black and white. Well, we're also giving the pass of like, well, the Justice League are are good guys. Yes. So we can't we got to have him go to heaven. But I do think it's interesting because um, this book does explore a lot of his morality, which also gets picked up in uh, later on in the Green Arrow Roman different writers take over. But like. It lets you question, like, is Oliver Queen a good person? Because he's treated these wonderful characters who are in his extended family very poorly. And then sometimes bringing them, it's it's hard to bring them back to his side. It's hard to get Dinah back on board. It's hard to get Connor back on board. I actually really like, this is jumping ahead a little bit, um, Ollie and Dinah's reunion. Because she does like call me pretty bird is what she says so much like she flings herself back into his arms and she kisses him because, of course, that's what you would do. Um, but it doesn't go back to being all rose-colored glasses. Their relationship is difficult. Yes. Um, something I want to talk about in this um, story mm-hmm. is the first appearance of Mia, the yeah. new Speedy. This is the storyline that introduces. Now, fun funny is that Kevin Smith doesn't make her Speedy. Now, he yeah. writes about seven more issues past this run. She doesn't become Speedy Judd Winnick is the one yep. that makes her speedy. Yeah. Now, you can kind of tell that's the intention. Absolutely. But I think it's interesting that Kevin Smith didn't do it. It was a later writer. What I find um, interesting now in hindsight and kind of seeing what Kevin has done with his career um, and to help the careers of members of his family is that he does set Mia up as a blonde teenager and he would have had a blonde teenager or a blonde preteen at the time. I he think. had a bra- blonde child. Uh, when he was writing this. So I, oh. I was like, oh, is this tr- Kevin Smith trying to set up a superhero character that his daughter could play one day? Oh, or do you think, do you think, I would say, I don't know if I'd go that far. Do you think it's just an analog for Harley Quinn Smith? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I just I just mean that through the through the the lens that we know he's put her in his movies and he's put her in some TV yeah. shows. So like I was like, oh, is that what this is? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Interesting. It's just the thought that I had. Uh, but she's not. She doesn't seem to be very much like Harley Quinn, who would have been young at sure. the time. Sure. <laughs> I also I also want to bring up the point that um, did you, do you know? And this might be spoilers for your later run. Do you know what happens to Mia? With her illness? Yes. Yes, I do. Okay, that's a Judd Winnick invention as yes, well. Yes, it is. Okay. And if you know anything about Judd Winnick and his work, I think it. Well, he it tend- makes sense. Uh, he I, tends to deal with. I that think theme. I think Judd Winnick is a great writer. Mm-hmm. Um, we can just say it like um, Judd Winnick makes Mia HIV positive. Yeah. Like 20 issues down the road. Uh, Judd Winnick tends to do that in a lot of his books, mm-hmm. but it's because his best friend in life was HIV positive. Yes, and I think so, passed, he passed away. Uh, yes, a long time yeah. ago. Yes. Uh, but Judd Winnick is a great writer, writer, so I don't mind. I will say I don't mind it for Mia either, considering her introduction in this book. Yes. Um, so another thing I want to talk about is, uh, first off, we have a cameo from Morpheus from Neil Gaiman's <laughs> Sandman in yeah. this book, which I love. Um <laughs> This book, when I first read it, I did not expect it to be so supernatural. Very. Jason Blood is mm-hmm. a major character in this book. Etrigan the Demon is a major character in the book. And the Family's f- Monster is a whole subplot. Yes. <laughs> and the final reveal that the the new Oliver that has been walking around the earth is a soul. Do they call it a what do they call it? A, a hollow. A hollow. Um very baked in demonology. Yeah. What did you think about that? Because Green Arrow, street-based character. Which is funny because when you and I, uh, we've obviously talked about uh, Arrow, the television show extensively, we're like, no, magic in Arrow. But uh, as, a, as a bringing a character back to life story, I think it works. I really liked all the places that the magic was employed and I thought he made, uh, they made smart choices. I love, I just love Jason Blood and Etrigan the game and like I do too. Anytime you can have them show up and it actually matters and it actually rings true is very interesting. I think this is a little bit um the creative team trying to be like, how many characters can we get away with having? This is a big romp through the DC universe. Yes. But there's also it's very reference filled. Mm-hmm. Um there's a lot of references to the hard traveling heroes, and that plays into the mysticism as well because of the Hal Jordan of it all. Well and I, I mean, actually think Hal is really great in this book. Um I He's a pilot, you know. Uh, yeah, he I'm a pilot. <laughs> um I'm a specter. Um <laughs> That because he's the specter at this yes, time because is. of the DC storyline Day of Judgment, mm-hmm. uh, which eh, I think we've talked about this before. I go back and forth on whether I like Hal Jordan as the specter. You know, he looks great. Uh, yes, his design as the specter yeah. is very cool. I will say this: uh, first off, DC TV 
a series about Etrick and the Demon called Blood great. would be uh, such a great show to watch. And yes. I will share run it for you at any time. Please call me on the bad phone. Please. Um, please, 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 please. The other thing is, is I don't mind this being a romp through the DC universe. It almost is a DC universe story more so than a greener mm-hmm. story. But to be honest with you, let's be honest. To be honest with you, let's be honest. I don't know what that means. <laughs> if you're writing a story like this and you think that this might be your only 10 issues that you might ever write in the DC universe, I think we both do it too. Yeah, but let's also be honest. When you are a person who comes into writing this book already famous, you can get away with saying, I want to have Batman and Superman in my Green Arrow book in a way that you or I yes. would not have that privilege. And, and and I think ultimately I'm okay with it because it works. Yes. This is a good book. And there is, um, Batman has a line in it that I quoted because I loved it so much. And it actually made me think of you, um, where he talks about how, Oliver was brought back from these particles that were in Superman's clothing. And uh, so Ollie's talking to Batman about it. Did you understand that, by the way? Yes, I did. Okay, cool. No, no, I'm just going to say, like, because uh, had you ever read the Green Arrow Death storyline? No. No, okay, no. So he's fighting eco terrorists. Yes. Uh, this is a Chuck Dixon storyline, actually. And he's on a plane. And the idea, the only way to defuse the bomb... Well, they basically show you this scene. Yeah, yeah. Is he has to, like, put his arm into the yeah, machine. And, it, yeah. and it, he can't get his arm out. Yeah. And so Superman is inside the plane. Yes. Super, Superman watches him go kablooey. But so... So there um, are, like, yeah, blood molecules of there would Oliver be. in so they, Superman. So they talk about that. They also make the joke that Superman doesn't wash his clothes as often. Yeah, which is... <laughs> as Batman. <laughs> Stupid. Um, but... Oliver's like, I don't know, like, do you do you believe that? Like, because he does, he can't reconcile the fact that he doesn't have a soul. And Batman says, and I quote, "If you can't trust the word of Superman, who can you trust?" End quote. It's true. Um, and I think that's a great line, and that's a great line to give to Batman. And it's like, well, I mean, if it weren't Kevin Smith writing, maybe we wouldn't have gotten that well, line. Well, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, Kevin Smith goes on to write more in the DC universe. He writes two Batman miniseries. Uh, I've read them. Huh? I've read them. Yeah, one is cacophony. Yes, and the other is like whirling dervish or something like that. Widening gyre. Yes. Or gyre. <laughs> yeah, widening gyre. Yeah. Um, whirling dervish. Yes. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I've named Kevin Smith's third Batman series. I don't enjoy widening gyre, but I enjoy parts of cacophony. I would say I enjoyed neither of them. Um, there's a really good uh, Nightwing Batman issue in Cacophony that I think is really good. Now, here's... I'll put I'll put some of that though. Um, he insisted that his friend draw it, which is a very sweet. Yes, thing the to uh, do. gentleman from uh, Comic Book Man. I can Men. see him in my brain, but I can't come up with his name. Ah, uh, God, Walter Flanagan. Yes. Um, and unfortunately, his art is not what I would have expected no. for a Batman story. I understand. Uh, we all do favors for our friends. We all bring our... I'm not saying that I wouldn't have done the exact same thing, but mm-hmm. in my opinion, as a consumer of those Batman runs, I think it's to the book's detriment. Well, w- Walter is sometimes a really good artist, and sometimes... He, he should be drawing monsters. Bat- but you can you can tell that he's not a consistently professional... Yes, yeah. Like, because there's just certain some pages that aren't as strong. But anyways, um, I completely forgot the point I was going to make. Now. It's okay, it'll come uh, Something about... Kevin Smith's further career. So, Ashley, what's your point? You're yeah. welcome. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of hard traveling hero references. Um, the editors do a really great job at making notes so that you can do further reading. You could do an entire recommended reading series based off of the editor's notes, which I thought was um, oh very funny. I got it. Okay. We're going to talk about Batman. Um, so, here's the thing I was going to say. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, Kevin Smith writes two more Batman miniseries yes. in the DC Universe. I think his Batman in this book is great. I agree. I think his Batman's really good. Um, I have problems with his Batman in both of those other series. So I find it interesting that right out the gate, I feel Kevin Smith, for me, nails Batman, Mm -hmm. but later on in Batman books doesn't. Yeah. Well, perhaps that's because, you know, sometimes you're good at something in small doses and you're not good at something in the long term. But, uh, you know, much respect to Phil Hester for giving us the long-eared Batman that we deserve. They also say in this volume that um, Oliver kills, Oliver shoots someone and kills him. And he's like, this is the first person I ever killed. Do we buy that for one single second? That Oliver's never killed anyone? No, you're you're misinterpreting that. What it is is that it's 
the Mike Grell run is the run where Oliver kills. And so what oh, do you... Oh, I thought it was in this one, and I was like, there's no way no, no, he's no, no, never no. killed anyone no, 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 no. So, so the point that, uh, again, for listeners, you should have read this book by now. Of course, obvious spoilers, duh. Um, when we meet the real Oliver in mm-hmm. heaven, the soul, yeah, that idea is the idea that he's saying that the... Oliver that is the hollow is the Oliver from before he killed that first man. Mm. So because in Mike Grell's run in the 80s reboot yeah. when he moves to Seattle and and Sherwood Flores and he and he becomes the the hooded man. Mm-hmm. He starts murdering people. Mm-hmm. He kills people. And so that's the delineation is that this is the Green Arrow from before the Mike Grell run. Okay, because I was like, that's ridiculous. No, 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 no. <laughs> because, yeah, 80s Green Arrow killed a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, 80s, 80s Green Arrow technically killed Hal Jordan. I mean, uh, yeah, true. <laughs> I'll, I'll say this as well about the Arrow show. Oliver Queen should kill people. It's more interesting. <laughs> I mean, that's what the first season. So, no, that that's that's what the point they were making. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. then that's my Sorry. mistake. That's yeah. fine. Um, my Another note I wrote down is I really love the way that they do Roy in this this book because Roy my preferred Roy Harper is kind of an idiot mm-hmm. and at the end but he when, thinks he's really cool he is really cool no he's not Roy Harper is so no, cool Roy Harper is a dork but he thinks he's cool I love Roy Harper he's a big dork when uh, Batman collects his uh, merry men to go save Oliver and Mia from Stanley's magic apartment uh, it's magically sealed, and Jason Blood says no one can get in there. It's a blood spell unless you have, unless you are related to, blah blah blah, so that Connor can come and save the day. Roy just tries to kick down the door and almost breaks his leg. And it's my single favorite Roy moment in the entire book. It brings me so much joy. There's two things I want to talk about now. Uh, you brought it up. The splash page of Connor Hawk. Oh, awesome. Look, so I would buy that page from I'll share anybody. It, uh, I'll share it on our um, lens. It is notes. so amazing, mm-hmm. that Connor Hawk page is so great. Um, I think Connor Hawk is great in this. Yeah. And this is the first Green Arrow storyline that Oliver accepts Connor as his son because it was a yes. storyline in the Chuck Dixon run where Oliver kept denying him. Mm-hmm. Oliver was a dick about it. And this is the start of Oliver being like, no, you're my son. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be your father and let's do this. And we're going to learn how we do this now. Um, and sometimes they're bad at it and that's cool. The thing I want to talk about real quick before we move on too much further is um, the explanation of how Oliver comes back to life. Now, it's kind of complicated, but because they base it in the idea that when Hal Jordan turned into Parallax, before he died, he was like, I'm going to bring my friend back. Mm-hmm. And the twist of like that the soul didn't want to come back, but the body did. Mm-hmm. Um, it's complicated. It's comic booky, But I kind of love it. I actually really, really like it. And I, to be honest with you, I think this is complicated. I keep, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. couching this. This is a complicated origin. I think this is, for me... One of the most impactful hero returns of any DC superhero, simply because it's couched in the idea that Hal Jordan's like, I wanted my best friend to live. Because the return of Hal Jordan is cosmic nonsense. The return of Barry Allen is cosmic nonsense. And even Superman is like, well, he didn't really die. Mm-hmm. He just like got really hurt. And he just came back to life. So you're like, wait, wait, he didn't die then. I don't know. For me, again, it's a lot of like mumbo jumbo. But again, because it's all based around like Hal being like, my best friend needs to live. I like it. What do you think about and what did you think about the reveal of like, this is how we bring Oliver Queen back? I don't know if I like it. Okay. But I appreciate the fact that we were given an explanation Mm -hmm. because sometimes heroes come back and no one really bothers to explain it. And I appreciate the fact that it is something that is easy to track. No one is easier to track than Jason Todd because you just say they hucked him in a Lazarus pit and now he's back. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate that it's not, well, depending on one's view of the Christian faith, it's not cosmic nonsense. Um, I, mean, I meant more the a, Hal Jordan stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's like, well, do you think God is cosmic nonsense? Or, you know, like that's a whole other discussion. Um, I appreciate that it is a straightforward, very easy explanation. And I like the dramatic impact of when the soul decides to come back and um, Oliver bargaining between these two aspects of himself. But when I take a step away, like if I were the editor reading that pitch, I don't know how I would feel about that just on paper. 
Like, it is complicated. Mm-hmm. It's executed well, mm-hmm. but it's still complicated. And it takes 10 issues to do. I it, also it's think, a long time coming. It I absolutely also think is. that's the other reason why it works, is because it's over 10 issues. Mm-hmm. If this had been over... We don't even address it in issue one. Well, we if, don't address it until issue four or five. But, but you can tell that he had this figured out oh, yes. at the beginning. Yes. Like, he didn't come up with this. That's why the ending works. That's why the ending works. And that's why these little elements work. And that's why Stanley works. Um... If he had done this over three issues, or even, I would even argue six, uh-huh. I think it would have completely fell flat. Yeah. Completely. It's because it's ten issues. And because when we're first introduced to the idea of it, it's just the memory loss. And you're like, okay, I guess he has amnesia. Like, they say amnesia, and you go, okay, that's fine. Uh, let's talk about this. At the end, we find out the reveal that Stanley Dover is evil, mm-hmm. the the benefactor of Oliver Queen. And also straight. <laughs> and also straight. And he's a necromancer, and he has this grandson who has this giant dog puppy bear thing that uh, he's this demon that he's been trying to Stanley's conjure forever. Stanley's monster. Um, yeah, Stanley's monster. I love that um, That's the one part of this book that kind of swerves hard left. The monster? Yeah, the monster. Mm -hmm. And that the monster is an actual character in this book. It looks great, though. Like, the design of it is so cool. I didn't care. It's Um, silly, though. Yes. um, Well, there's one thing I want to talk about, and then we can go through your notes, and then I want to talk about the Kevin Smith of it all. Okay. Um, I love the final page of this book. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I also would buy the original art to to this last page. Uh, over and over and over and over again because the last page is six panels of Connor and Oliver yeah. just talking. And uh, I love that it ends with the, the dialogue of um, Oliver. Like, But for today, i just like to hang out with my son. You do have a car, don't you? A car? I don't even have a license. Kid, I think this is the start of a beautiful relationship. And like, or and that to me is like that. All only Oliver Queen would make that joke, and the fact that he doesn't understand that Connor is like so Zen, but as a Buddhist. Well, yeah, but also I love that. Like at the end of the day, that this Oliver came back for his son, mm-hmm. who up to this point in comic book history, he had denied at every turn mm-hmm. and said, "Go away, go away, I hate you." Well, it's a really great way to redeem a very problematic aspect of this character. Yeah. Because um, Oliver Queen is a little bit of the Han Solo type up to this point. Sure. Uh, where he's kind of a jerk, but we like him because he's charming. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate the fact that he's not given a pass on that anymore. So we undo that horrible aspect of his character. Um, any other things you'd like to bring up about Quiver? Those are all, we went through organically all my points. So if you want to move on to the next okay. discussion point, let's do it. The final discussion point of this is, is Kevin Smith. Mm-hmm. You cannot read this book without talking about Kevin Smith and Kevin Smith impacts this book. Kevin Smith is a giant podcaster. Mm -hmm. We've met him in real life. Mm -hmm. He's a super friendly dude. Very nice man. Um, He also, we have to, you have to reconcile the point and look at this fairly. Um, He got this book because he was a movie director. Yeah. Um, This book is great. I think it's well written. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are some points in this book that are very Kevin Smithy. There are pages in this book that are filled with so much dialogue mm-hmm. and, and a lot of panels that, too. Most, yeah. there's maybe two splash pages in the whole book and uh, most pages mm-hmm. have more than seven panels well there's a lot there's a lot of really 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 wordy pages in this book yeah. but I'm gonna say this is not as bad as Guardian Devil Guardian Devil there, sure. there's like the first two issues and I like Guardian Devil as well mm-hmm. where oh my god the word balloons are just it might as well have been a novel. There's yeah. so yeah. many. There's probably a thousand words on one page in mm-hmm. Guardian Devil. And you're just like, a thousand words. Get out of here. Um, but then there's also times where Kevin Smith, he, he gets kind of raunchy. He gets kind of, he does some mm-hmm. swerves where you're like, I don't know if I want the DC universe to be like that. I agree. Um, but on the other side of this, I don't know. If any other writer, any other writer Mm -hmm. had come to DC and said, I want to bring back original Oliver Queen, if DC would have let them do it or DC would have been like, get out of here. I wonder if they only let him do it because he was a movie director. But I will say this. This is one of the Silver Age resurrections that I like. Yeah. Because I don't like, I'm sorry, I I just really want to finish. I don't like Hal Jordan's and I don't like Barry Allen's. Uh, Go ahead, Ashley, I'm sorry. It is tough to reconcile these two aspects. And I actually found the introduction, which is written by Kevin Smith, a tough pill to swallow. Mm. It is basically, in my opinion, Kevin Smith patting himself on the back for how great he is. In fact, he drops uh, several of his other projects that you can go and purchase. And and we want to say it that we like Kevin Smith. Absolutely, but I'm trying to to, to come at this critically. Mm -hmm. Um, 
in that book, he states that like no one wanted to let him write Batman, so he wrote Green Arrow and he made Green Arrow sell a million issues. Green Arrow, uh, which, th- this book was the best selling DC book which, when it came out. Is an absolute and true fact, and I will never yep. take away from him. He brought back a character, and he made him mainstream, and he made him matter in a way that this character had never mattered and before. And we get Arrow because, because of, of this, this book. And we get, um, I mean, honestly, like better, some of the best Arrow mm-hmm. stories come after Kevin Smith's run because he brought him back in this way, and because yep. he had the clout to bring him back in this way. I but, will also say, uh, there's probably a chance that Green Arrow never shows up on Smallville without this book. Well, I can't speak to Smallville, so well, I'm just saying, like, I have no opinion about that personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, you know. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I have a tough time reconciling it because um, the privilege of Kevin Smith's success um, is very evident in this book. But then this book doesn't happen without And I also him. think you cannot not talk about it. Absolutely not. Yeah. It would be irresponsible. Yeah. It would be irresponsible not to look at it critically from both sides. And, mm-hmm. like, you know, we were talking earlier about, like, all the word balloons and all the panels and, like, all the Justice League shows up. Yeah. Um, Let's be honest. Um, I don't know who edited, whoever edited this book. Kevin Smith didn't get no notes on this book. Mm-hmm. No editor gave him any notes on this book. Uh, it went to the artist. The artist drew it. Maybe the artist I got a couple think, notes. If I remember right, because it wasn't in the credits, I think it's Bob Shrek. Yes, the famous abso- Batman. Editor. You're absolutely yeah. correct. Yes, it is. Um, but when certain creators reach a certain caliber, no one tells them no. And yes. he he walked into DC being able to be like that. Yeah. Um. So it is difficult. You're right. There's no way to not talk about it. But it is not. It's difficult when the book doesn't succeed. In like there are two jokes about Black Canary being wet that mm-hmm. no other writer, male, female, uh, anything in between, no other writer could have ever put that in, even in a modern book. Mm-hmm. And gotten away with it if it were not Kevin Smith. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I don't know if I want that in my <laughs> Green Arrow story. By the way, I just want to apologize to um, uh, Ashley was, of course, talking about Black Canary uh, washing dishes. Swimming. Uh, and swimming. There is a scene where she is washing dishes and then stops washing dishes. Yes. Um, you know, so for me... We were referring mo- to nothing else. For me, moments <laughs> like that are really... It's hard not to spin out and get really upset about them being left in because no one else would have been allowed to do that. But conversely, when that really works, like where we get this, I I like the scene where both versions of Oliver are talking to himself in heaven. Yeah. And like, that's another really big, crazy swing that maybe a, a lower tier writer would not have been allowed to do at yeah. the time. And I respect the fact that Kevin Smith's status allowed him to do that. So it, it is this weird, nebulous thing thing that hangs over this book you know and and let's be honest this book has an absolute because it has kevin smith's name on it oh 100 percent. people will people will take this to a convention just like you did and just like i would have and, and get it signed by but him. I, I also will say this and and this is part of it this book has never gone out of print no it hasn't and and again i think it's a great jumping on point mm-hmm. even though it is like you sort of have to know a little bit but i think it fills you in i uh, think if you basically know that Oliver Queen died. That's all. Yeah, I think you can you can, you can muddle out. through. Uh, yeah. I, will, I will also say this: all these criticisms of Kevin Smith is in juxtaposition of he pulls it off. Absolutely, I, I really think he pulls it off. I do think that this story is really good mm-hmm. and has a lot of great character moments. It's just that every once in a while, there's that thing where you're like, oh. Oh, that's definitely Kevin Smith. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and we uh, try to be fair and balanced. We've been critical yeah. of all the books that we've done. On uh, if you're okay with it, let's jump into some Patreon questions. Let's here, Ashley. do it. Uh, so Ashley, if they want to get some questions that they want to talk about on the next book club, how can they do that? If you go to patreoncom slash Jawin, you should know how to spell Jawin by this point, and you donate even at the one dollar level. We put up our post the day that the episode drops when it is announced, and you have until you are done reading the book. To comment, question, concern, or joke at us, and we'll read it here on the podcast. Yes, uh, and we have some other cool stuff over there, like Geek History Lesson Extra. We have Jason and Ashley's Extra Adventures, all kind of stuff like that. Um, so you come over and be a member of the Super Friends, the Hall of Super Friend Justice over at jo- uh, patreon.com. Uh, you know, you get to take part in the book club better than listening to it. Yeah. All right. So uh, first question here comes from Nicholas Baldwin. Uh, he said, boy, this has been a hard one to jump in on if it hadn't have been for all years lessons. I would have been even more lost, so thank you for that. As I'm reading chapter two, I feel like the conversation between Ollie and his apparent roommate was a bit dated and sexist. I think that's the, Di- the Dinah Lance Black Canary scene because uh, she has black hair. I, or do you think it's Stanley? I think this is him talking Stanley. to Stanley okay. because Stanley – finish the question and I'll address okay, it. Okay, so the he has he – has, the first question he has, he has the second one. Do you agree on your read this time 
think that this is just indicated of the time or maybe Kevin Smith. Okay, so what he's talking about is in the second issue, um, Ollie and Stanley are having breakfast and Stanley basically comes on to Ollie and Ollie's like, ha ha ha, I thought I was the only queen in this apartment. Mm. Um and again, this one of those Kevin Smith things is kind of difficult to reconcile. Kevin Smith um, has been a big advocate of the LGBTQIA yeah. plus community. Um, he's always stood up for queer creators and queer folk, and he's brought them onto his um, productions in the past, and he's written stories about it. I think this is the same thing that you have when you watch Chasing Amy. Mm. At the time, this was probably pretty progressive, yep. probably pretty modern. Chasing Amy's the same way, but in hindsight, you're like, this is not as sensitive as it should be. I think it's I think it's just a mark of the time. And I don't think it's meant to be hurtful. I think it's meant to be funny. And those jokes don't play anymore, unfortunately. Uh, Nicholas also has a follow-up question. He says, also, I am really loving the way the panels are laid out in this book. Is that how a lot of comics were at the time? Or is something unique to the artist? Um, there's <laughs> Phil Hester doing his best. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think... Um, I don't think it has comics in 2001 were like this. I think it's one, Phil Hester is just an amazing artist. Yeah. And two, I think it's Phil Hester being like, gotta get around the word balloons. Uh, yeah. How am I <laughs> supposed to fit nine panels onto this page? Yeah, exactly. Um, Phil Hester also, just in addition to drawing like some great characters, draws is, is a layout, a king of the layout. God, he's so Does good. a great job. So good. I love his eyes. Uh, by the way, if you're playing on the GHL bingo card, you just uh, you just got a square. So okay. <laughs> There you go. Uh, David L. A. Skelton asks... Uh, said, what is all the backstory to Canary being pissed at Oliver? I thought it was the Prometheus stuff, but that happens afterwards. What's all the backstory that the Green Arrow in Heaven wants to forget? Okay, so... She slept... He slept with Shadow. Yes. So, they are directly referencing the Mike Grell um, Green Arrow run from the 80s. That's, Mm -hmm. again, where he he gets the hood, he goes to Seattle, because Oliver cheats on Dinah. Yeah. And Oliver murders people, and Oliver becomes really, really angry and gruff and serious. It's actually very proto-Arrow, CW's Arrow. It is, and Arrow takes a lot of influence. I actually think it's a really good run. Mm -hmm. Um, I like the sort of happier Oliver better, Mm -hmm. Uh, but that is, it's direct, it's all direct references to the Michael Grell run. So if you're interested in that, uh, God, what is the name of it? Um... You know what? I can look it up. Yeah, his like run has a because he has a mini series and then it goes into his Green Arrow run. But the, his mini, it's not Hard Traveling Heroes or Emerald Archer or something like that. I don't know. I will find it while you move on to the next question. Okay, uh, so here we go. Um, David also follows up with another question. He says, "What do you think makes Green Arrow?" Distinct. He says, Greeno started off as nothing more than a Batman ripoff, but he's now become a character in his own right. What do you think makes him distinct, and how does this story accentuate that characteristic? Uh, for me, outside of being a social justice warrior, one thing that Guggenheim said that resonated with me is Oliver is always a screw up that survives by the skin of his teeth. Um, I agree with that. Um, Volume one is called Hunter's Moon. Oh, it's it's called it's Hunter something. It's Hunter prayers of the ah whatever. I don't care. Um, anyways, we'll figure it out later. You Google it, everybody. Anyways, um, so um, first off, I'm just gonna say uh, I don't think Social Justice Warrior is a bad thing. Uh, I think that's a good thing. Because uh, he also wrote the Longbow Hunters. The Longbow Hunters. That's what it is. Thank you. Thank <laughs> there you. There you go. Sorry, we found uh, it eventually. Yes. You're uh, welcome. <laughs> I think Social Justice Warrior is a good thing because that's what Superman is. Hmm. Um. He's the first. Uh, if you don't want to say that, if that, if you were too much of a snowflake to be able to take that title, mm-hmm. uh, he was the first socially conscious superhero. I don't even want to use those terms. Um, I think that's those are just ridiculous terms to divide us all, and I don't want to say them um, because we're all human beings at the end. And if you don't believe that, shut up. Okay. Uh, uh, no name calling around here on any side, even to our fictional characters. Everybody, we all, <laughs> we all, we're all freaking human beings. All right. So. Um, I think the Guggenheim thing nails it. I think Green Arrow's distinctness is, and I think a lot of the heart of this story is about that Oliver is a screw up, and now he's been given a second chance. We love a redemption arc. And he's trying to do his best, Mm -hmm. you know, so. Uh, David A. Skelton, I just want to say I hope, uh, uh, you know, I didn't offend you at any point with that. Oh, uh, no, we've met David. He's a very nice guy. Uh, Yeah, I just, you know, we, uh, you know. We get passionate sometimes. We're all humans, man. Don't we don't need labels and crap. We're all humans. Okay, uh, Cody Enos Enos Enos. <laughs> uh, Cody, I apologize. Cody, you're great. <laughs> uh, Cody wrote a a really 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 long comment 
Um, that Which re- is excellent. You can you guys can write to your heart's content, but when that happens, we will compress when we read it. That's yeah, all. so I'm going to compress this, Cody, so please apologize. Uh, so, um, he says that Kevin Smith's Quiver was the first Green Arrow comic I read, and I was really confused because, one, I had no idea he died, two, had no idea he had a son, three, the connecting tissue with the DC Universe I didn't understand, like the Spectre in Evil How, but that did not detract me from enjoying the story. And like Blackest Night, it made me want to learn more about the DC universe. Uh, With that said, uh, he said, you'll probably cover this in your episode. Should more origins or starting points have more connective tissue to the larger universe like Quiver or be standalone and super new reader friendly like Marvel does slash New 52 slash Rebirth where stories start off with a basic knowledge of the character? That's a great question, actually. Interesting. Um, I will say that Green Arrow actually has a version of that. It's called Green Arrow Year One. Um, Written by Andy Diggle. Drawn by Jock. Who uh, Andy is Diggle the namesake of. A namesake of John Diggle. That's right. Yep. Um, so a lot of characters actually have that in the modern age for exactly this reason. Because yeah. uh, comics are complicated. We're lucky that we have Wikipedia now because when we were kids, uh, you just kind of figured it out. You just made it, in, you made it work. You filled in the gaps. You literally made it work. And then you'd find another issue where you'd be like, hey, this is the Spectre now. Okay, cool. Now I understand There were it. so many runs when I was reading in the 90s where I just, I never knew. Yeah. I never figured it out till later or till we did research for a Geek of History lesson where I was like, oh, hey, that's why that happened. Um, and I do think it's funny that Cody credits it's Marvel for that because I actually think DC does a way better job because DC, for at least their Justice League and their Justice League adjacent characters, all have a book called Insert Superhero Name Here, colon, Year One. Year one. Um, now, most of those books are 15 or 20 years old by this point. Most of them are still in print. Also, a lot of them are recent. Like they, they, yeah. They've been leaning on that Frank Miller title. You know, well, Frank Miller started it, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And um, but I think of like Batgirl and Robin Year One are like seventeen years old. Yeah, they were the nineties. Yeah, um, like you know, um, so DC actually, I think for a long time did this before Marvel even entertained doing an updated origin of it. Um, that's kind of a newer thing that Marvel has picked up. I I think. Right. It depends on the reader. This is like that thing where what comic should I read for the first time? Um, and that's stuff that we struggle with when we try to pick our recommended reading. Yeah. Um, something like Green Arrow Year One is a much cleaner jumping on point. You literally need to know absolutely nothing. But I don't think Quiver is an impossible jumping on point uh, either, especially because the editor's notes are so good. Yeah. Um Okay, uh, real quick, just we ended on um, Ashley. I know we don't usually do a recommended reading for the book clubs, but um, I think you should make a note because I would love if we just gave everybody the first three volumes of this run. Oh, because sure. we yeah. talked yeah, about yeah, yeah. them so much. Well, they're. I also recently read them. I kept reading after. Yeah, the um, they're very tied together. So mm-hmm. when you have that familiarity, it's hard not to reference them. Yeah. I will happily. Do I think that. we've referenced them so much that I think uh, some of our listeners might actually want to uh, read them, and I, I hope you do because again, this is my favorite run of Green Arrow, all the way to issue seventy-five. Uh, that Judd Winnick, because Judd Winnick writes the most. All right, uh, now we're to the section where we're going to rate this book. On a scale of one to five, GHL intern Bregos, uh, GHL intern Brego Cat is in the room. Uh, Brego, would you like to comment on Green Arrow Quiver? His word choice. He's so eloquent. Yes, exactly. Uh, Ashley, Green Arrow Quiver issues one uh, through ten of the Green Arrow volume. Yes. How many Bregos? I was initially inclined to give it four uh, Bregos because I think the story is really good. I think the art is tremendous. Uh, However, there are some problematic things um, that some people I think might be sensitive to. Uh, so I'm going to give it a three. Oh, interesting. Does this podcast knock it down for you? Um, I was really... Really, uh, intern Brego just walked under my chair. Uh, sorry, he distracted my attention. I was really, really taken aback by um, this one particular word use. So, um, and I know that I'm I'm not the group of people who would be most sensitive to that. And I just think that's kind of sad. Uh, it's kind of like that old Superman issue where Lois Lane gets turned into an African American for one issue, you know? Yeah, what if Lois was black? Yeah. I think is what they call it. Yeah, and then she turns back into a white person and is so grateful for it. And um, again, I, I can respect the fact that it was written at a different time. I can respect the fact that that word um, 
was a little more in our sphere than it is now, but I, it's really tough for me in good conscience to give it a higher rating than that. But I did enjoy it. So three out of five Bregos for me. How about you, Jason? Look, I think there are some troubling things in the story. And I think there are some dated things in this story. But I think when this story hits it out of the park, it knocks it so far out of the park. And I, I will admit my bias a little bit. Like, this is the sure. story that got me into Green yeah. Arrow. And, but I will say at the same time, when I reread this mm-hmm. this week, I was blown away with how well it stood up for me. Mm-hmm. I was expecting, I was really worried that I was like, oh, is this going to be the time I don't like it? Yeah, it's really sad when that happens. <laughs> no, I liked it just as much. Mm-hmm. And I noticed the things because of time. Mm-hmm. And yes, they're inappropriate. And yes, they're kind of out there. But to me, it doesn't knock it down. The overall impact of this story is still strong. To me, I would compare this to a Quentin Tarantino movie. There are problematic things in every Quentin Tarantino movie, every one of them. But when he is firing on all cylinders, it's a home run. And I think Kevin and Phil Hester make so many right moves, more right moves in this than wrong moves that mm-hmm. it, that it I think it knocks away the, the wrong moves. Mm-hmm. I think there are, there are double the right moves and wrong moves. So I can't give this anything but a five out of five. Sure. I think this is, I literally think this is one of the best Green Arrow storylines of all time. I think there's a reason why this was the best-selling DC book when it came out. I mean, part of that was Kevin Smith. But I think the story was so damn good. And I think there's a reason why this created a Green Arrow resurgence in uh, the comic book community. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, All right. So now we're going to announce what the next book is in the GHL book club is and when that's going to happen so you have enough time to read it. Uh, Ashley, what is the next book in the GHL book club? Boy, oh boy, are you surely going to need time to read this book because it is long and it is wordy and there's nine panel grids plenty. Our next book is Watchmen. And we are, uh, the episode will go live on September 24th. Okay, so they're going to get a whole month to read this book. You have a Good. full Four, we built in a full four weeks mm-hmm. for this. Yes. Uh, so that's the Tuesday. So whatever the Friday before that uh, is going to be the deadline. All the posts will be up there. They're up on the website and everything. They're up Rorschach's on Journal. Um, August <sighs> something, 1985. You will read this book. You will get to page 17. You will look up at me and say, this is so wordy, but I like it. And I will look down upon you and say, I don't care. Yes. Uh, We're also planning to have a very special guest for that. uh, Yeah, I'm excited for the guest. Who our patrons will also know about. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, So Watchmen, because the big HBO show's coming down the pike. Yeah. Uh, All right. So now we're into the final section of the podcast, the honor roll. Ashley, what's that? The honor roll is where if you go over to Apple Podcasts and you give us five stars, we'll read whatever you write. Yes. uh, We have two people joining the honor roll. This week, Ashley, who are they? The first person joining the honor roll is CCO19, who says, Great podcast. This is an amazing podcast. I'm a big fan of all the superhero TV out there, and I thought all of the comic book aspects were great, but had never really gotten into comics until listening to you guys. So thanks for all the recommended reading. I also supported science because I would totally go to a school called the Prometheus Institute. What a great name. Thank Thank you, you, CCO19. Um, Also, I'm just going to tack something on to the end of this. If you maybe missed out on supporting science, you can pre-order it by going to sciencecomicbook.com. That's right. There's a little uh, order it here on the Kickstarter. Yes. Yes. So now would be the best time to do it because it won't be available for several months after that. So thank you so much for supporting science. And CCO19 is also being joined by Rozzy24, who says, thank you both for expanding my comics knowledge. I've discovered more about some characters that I knew really well. If I could, I would like to suggest an episode about Blue Marvel or Icon from the Dakotaverse. Interesting. Uh, Those will definitely be added to our suggestions. I like Icon a lot. Uh, And they finish by saying, you guys do a great job, so keep up the good work with a thumbs up. Cool. Well, welcome into the teacher's lounge over in the corner. We have um, some metal work uh, from Mr. Rusty. What does uh, Mr. Rusty teach? Automotive repair and restoration. (laughs) 
It's a very timely reference for yes. Jason. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, I've been launching a lot of car shows lately. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you want to be like those cool people, go over to Apple Podcasts and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. Also, make sure you can download us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Stitcher. If there is a podcast player out there that you want to use and we're not on it, please let us know. And also, uh, for the rest of the year, if you really love Geek History Lesson, do us a favor. Tell your friends about your favorite episode. If this is your favorite episode or uh, let's say the Nightwing episode or the Fantastic Four episode, share your favorite episode with one of your friends and let's let, let's grow the mind university. I really want to grow the mind university. I want to get new students for the rest of the year. I'm going to tease this too. November is National Podcast Month. Ooh. And uh, we have some plans. We, have we some need thoughts. to come up with a hashtag, Ashley. I think we need to make a note about that. And we need to come up with some sort of hashtag to grow the mind university and and give out prizes and I just want I, don't, I just want to up the enrollment. I think so. So uh, I know it's going to be almost September when this episode comes out. So keep your eyes, keep your ears open. In October, we're going to be announcing a lot of fun stuff like that. Yes. Also, don't forget to go over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Jawin, and you can listen to this week's exclusive Patreon episode of GHL Extra, which will be all about Kevin Smith's impact on Green Arrow and basically his impact on comic books as a whole. Uh, don't forget you can follow the podcast on Twitter at GHL Podcast. You can follow Ashley on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V. Robinson. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Jawin, J A W I I N. Also, don't forget you can go to Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, Target.com, Walmart.com, and you can pick up my book, Super Soldiers, a Ooh. salute to the comic book superheroes and villains that have served our country. It is a personal memoir about my time in the military uh, told through the lens of comic book superheroes that have served in the United States military. So if you want a little bit mix of my personal life and a mix of comic book history, I think that's the book for you. Hashtag stick around, Ashley, the last section of the podcast where we make sure that you guys like listen. We stick through the plugs. Uh, By the way, you can always tell us that you like the hashtag stick around by going to Twitter Using it, hashtag stick around. Mm-hmm. Ashley. Yeah. What's your favorite Green Arrow comic book costume? I asked this because this is the storyline that brought back the Neil Adams Robin Hood Green Arrow costume, which I was not a big fan of until I saw Phil Hester draw it. Um, but what's I, your favorite comic I don't, costume? I don't like his uh, classic costume. I think it's silly. Um, I really liked the costume that uh, Spirit Ollie was wearing when he was in heaven. Okay. I think that's a really good look. You can go outside of the storyline if you like um, as well. But I, like, I genuinely actually really like that look. I think the best Green Arrow costume is season two of Arrow, actually, mm. which is basically the season one costume. I'm asking but, about comic books. But with the domino mask. No, I, I think that costume was really good. Um. Which is more or less what the costume has turned into now in the comics. Not really. I mean, post Arrow, they just draw the Arrow costume. No, they don't. Okay. They've never actually drawn it in the main comic book continuity. Okay. They've only done it in the comic books. Uh, no, he's always had this like armor plated thing. They've brought the hood back. Yeah, but he has like armor armor there it's it's supposed to be kevlar so it's made of plastic yeah uh plates in the show no the only actually show costume that made it into the comic books is the smallville costume and that was when they were doing that stupid storyline um it's really dumb uh it's the prometheus storyline it's the um justice league cry for justice oh yes where they like kill roy's daughter yeah so in that storyline they gave ollie the smallville green arrow costume and that's cool looking costume doesn't fit comic book Ollie. What is your favorite um, comic um, Green Arrow costume? So weirdly, I kind of like the costume that was in Brightest Day. Uh huh. Um, that is the the run's not great, but it's sort of a mix between the Longbow Hunters mm-hmm. and uh, a sort of a version of the movie of the of the Arrow costume. And I don't think uh-huh. Arrow was on the air at that point, but he has a hood. I like Green Arrow with a hood. Um, and it has, it just looks like Robin Hood yet with the hood. It's not as goofy, mm-hmm. but I will say, I do think the current rebirth costume is pretty good. I like the rebirth costume. I think the rebirth costume is pretty good. Um, Green Arrow, to be honest with you, has had a lot of great costumes because I even like the new 52 design. Well, um, because the basic. <laughs> it's Robin Hood. 
I mean, but when it's too rough, like when it laces up in the front, I think that's very silly. But like yes. once they put a hood on it, you were like, that's it. Yeah, yeah, put the yeah. costume to bed. Give I don't know why giving him a hood really worked mm-hmm. because a hood is deeply impractical. It's yeah, impractical for tactical, yes. Uh, same thing with capes, but I stand a cape. Um but yeah, the hood for me mm-hmm. just really brings the look together. Yeah. Honestly, my favorite Green Arrow costume is the classic speedy costume. It's I love it so much. Oh, the silver age. It's one? stupid. Mm-hmm. And it's like stupider than the original Green Arrow because it's yeah. red. But I really love it with the little uh, Robin Hood hat. I mainly just wanted to bring this up because I find it's an ex- it's an interesting talent to see what comic book artists can draw the uh-huh. goofy Neil Adams costume and make it work. Yeah, I just really like. I don't like the lace up in the front. That I get for you. me is like the detail but that's too far. I can accept it when Phil Hester draws. I mean, it. Phil, look, Phil Hester can draw what's a uh, horse. A Actually, car, uh, one anything. of my he's great. One of my more one of my other favorite costumes, it's a very simple, it's a very stripped down uh-huh. Oliver costume, is the costume that he has at the end of this run in the last 10 issues. Yeah. Uh, Scott McDaniel, Nightwing artist, redesigns a costume where he has a very simple hood mm-hmm. and a very simple green tunic and a uh, belt with a G. Mm-hmm. And he has a sword in his quiver. Oh, yes. And that is a uh-huh. story. If you finish this run, I'm not going to tell you. There's a story reason for the sword. And uh, that is one of my favorite costumes because I love that period of Green Arrow. Um, just to say one more thing about yeah. the art and the art in Quiver specifically, they color his eyes such a bright green. Mm-hmm. And I love it. Yes, it's really cool. Thank you, Andy. Phil Hester is really good at the at eyes, I think, too. Mm-hmm. So even though he didn't color them. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to our Quiver-filled episode of Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Laced Up the Front Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And Professor Jason, would you please dismiss the class? Arrow away!